I've been running for Jesus a my long time. I'm not tired serving God. Choose ye this day whom you shall serve. So we thank God for the, the ministry of our male chorus leading us into this time. Amen. It is time for the word of God. Amen. And as I shared with our early service this morning, there are many times when we come to church and we find that the word of God soothes us and makes us feel good and encourages us. But when I read in the Bible, it said that he whom he loves, he chastises. And so sometimes the word comes to stir us up. Sometimes the word might step on your toes. But we have to understand that it's all done because of God's great love for us. And so when we stand here to proclaim the word of God, we have to acknowledge that, yes, many times as preachers, we want to make you feel good. But we have a divine obligation to tell you the truth of what God's word says. And we cannot afford to, to fall into the trap of knowing that it's got to make everybody happy all the time. We've got to speak the truth as it is presented in the word of God. Amen. So that's my disclaimer this morning. That's my disclaimer. To God be the glory. I endeavor to not preach anything that I don't see in the Bible. Amen. Amen. So won't you go with me today to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're returning to our journey through 1 and 2 Corinthians, and we will be here for a while, the Lord says the same. We're going to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 through 11, we are continuing this book, which we know was written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians who were living in Corinth, a church that he had founded. And after he left, he found he got a letter from a woman by the name of Chloe saying, Brother Paul, there is some trouble going on in the church. And we know you can't run back over here, but if you'll just send a letter that can be read to the people in the church through God's power, because God's power is unlimited. It, it does not know time or space. And so if you will just speak a word, we will make sure that this word gets out to the church so that we can get back on the right track. And so we study First and Second Corinthians because we realize, as I said at the beginning, human nature does not change. The same problems they had in the church in Corinth We've got the same problem in the church today. Amen. And when I speak of the church, I'm not talking about Second Missionary Baptist Church on the corner of 4th and Broadway. I'm talking about within the body of believers, we have some problems that need to be addressed. We have some things going on in the lives of the people living in Corinth. Those same things are going on in the lives of people today. So the word of God is eternal. The word of God is always applicable. But most of all, the Bible says the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting asunder. Amen. Amen. So you might get cut today, but just... God is a healer. Yes, he is. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. You may be seated. 
So this afternoon, I want to speak to you from this thought. Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day. You're an awesome God. You are sovereign. You have all power, all knowledge. For you alone knew in advance who would be here in this sanctuary at this appointed time. So we thank you, Lord, for what you have already done. We thank you for what you're doing right now. We thank you for what you have in store. We pray by faith that there will be a word from the Lord today that will speak with such simplicity that everyone here will be able to understand, find themselves in the word, and use that word to strengthen them for the journey that lies ahead. We thank you, God, because we know you do all things well. Your timing is impeccable. And so we give you the glory and the honor for this special time of worship, this special time of reflection, this special time of considering your perfect will for each of our lives. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. Whenever we speak of someone having a past, the general understanding is that the individual has done something reprehensible, something that would be looked down upon by those people who consider themselves to be the moral gatekeepers of our time. And I used to think that you had to be a certain age or that you had to come from a certain background, that you had to have a certain type of personality or character or lifestyle to have a past. But I've lived long enough to really understand that everybody has a past. Everybody. For even right now, there isn't a child in this room, little kid, who hasn't done something that they would rather their parents not know about. The baby got a past. Just as there isn't an adult in this room. who hasn't done something that you would rather not see broadcast on the 6 o'clock news. Amen. Amen. And for that person who is sitting here right now, feeling pretty good about yourself, because you can truthfully say that you haven't done anything. You say, I haven't done anything. I don't lie. I don't cheat, you know, I tell the truth all the time. I'm good to my mom and daddy. I walk my dog, I water my grass. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't run around. I don't cuss nobody out, you know. I pray three times a day, I fast. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm just perfect. Well, I tell you, you better check your thoughts. Because my Bible says uh, in Proverbs 23 and 7, as a man thinks in his heart, and that's not just talking about the male of the species, that's talking about humankind. He says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And the truth is that if some of the things that we have thought could suddenly develop legs, stand up and walk around, we would identify ourselves as a sinner among sinners. So we might as well just confess and tell the truth. Because even though other folks can only see us from the outside, my Bible says that God sees our hearts. And he alone knows the secrets of your thoughts and your desires. And if you are living in this present moment, You certainly have a past. Uh And I know by faith that you have a future. And when I hold a newborn baby, I'm sometimes saddened because I know that regardless of how much this little baby is loved, that no one will be able to shield him or her from the difficulties of this life. As a child journeys throughout its life, there will be joy and sorrow. There will be moments of victory and failure. 
There will be times of health and sickness. They will experience love and rejection. But not only that, the word of God also reveals that all of us will have to wrestle with the temptation to disobey God. And that there will be some times when each one of us will lose the fight and we will become a victim to that temptation and we will fall into sin. I'm not making this up because Romans 3 and 22 and 23 says, well, there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all means everybody. And although it is inevitable that sooner or later at some point on your journey we are all going to sin and fall beneath the standard that God has ordained in his word, the good news is that God's grace, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness is always available. Because 1 John 1 and 9 promises that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you know what? The Bible also states in Numbers 32 and 23 that if you sin against God, you can be sure that your sin will find you out. In other words, if we persist in our sins, we can be equally assured that someday the sins of our past will be introduced to our present. Uh, When David fell into sin with the woman by the name of Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet came to him, and told him and revealed to him that God knew the desires of his heart and God knew all the sin that he had committed. David had to confess that I was born in sin and I was shaped in iniquity. When there was a special calling on the life of Isaiah, Isaiah confessed, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And sooner or later, we all must come face to face with our own unrighteousness. That after all the good that we think we do, when we compare it to the holiness of God, all of our righteousness is still as filthy rags. And when you come face to face with your own unrighteousness, I come to tell you that that is an appointed time. That is a day of decision. That is a fork in the road when you are going to have to decide whether or not you're going to continue to drag the failures of your past around you for the rest of your life like a 50 ball ball, uh, chain and ball or are you going to give it to Jesus? Well, there are millions of social workers and psychologists and counselors that will be glad to schedule an appointment with you for a fee, for a fee, for a fee. They want to help you heal your broken memories, overcome the pain of your past. There are doctors and psychiatrists. They would love to to give you a prescription so that you can begin to try and cope. And that's all right. That has its place. But I'm not a doctor. So I can't give you the advice of a doctor today. But I've come to tell you I'm just a preacher. And I heard about a man that the Bible calls a wonderful counselor. Well, bless his name. And he has a remedy for all of us who have done some things that we shouldn't have done, who've been some places we shouldn't have been, who have hooked up with some folks we should have left behind, who have made some choices that turned out to be the wrong choices. They tell me his name is Jesus. And he's already provided a treatment plan and a prescription for the sin problem that has you bound to your past. 
For he said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man, any man. be in Christ Jesus, yeah. he is a new creature, that old things are passed away, and behold, all things shall become new. If you can just believe and receive the power of what this scripture promises, it will heal you and set you free. But just like the medicine that the doctor gave you, if you leave it sitting on the shelf, it won't do you any good. You got to get the word of God down on the inside. You got to put it in your mind. You got to put it in your heart. You got to digest it. That's what David was talking about when he said, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The issue is that we got too many baptized, born again believers sitting in church every Sunday. And they still tied up, tangled up, and bound. We got too many people who have made a confession of faith, but they still feel themselves trapped time and time again because the enemy walks into the living room of their mind, kicks back in the lazy boy of their heart, pops in a DVD entitled All the Failures of Your Past. And then they turn around on you and say, this is what we're watching tonight. And we sit there and entertain the enemy and watch it until we begin to wish that we could turn back the hands of time, start over and make some different choices. We start thinking, if I, only I had known then what I know now. And even though as believers, we know that the word of God said in Romans 8 and 1 that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. We know that. Yes. But when we allow the enemy to keep hitting the replay button over and over again, we find ourselves lying weak on the couch of our spirit feeling guilty and worthless. But the good news is that there is a bridge that you can cross over that will carry you away from living in regret about what you used to be into the place where you can rejoice because of what you can become because of God's grace, his love, his power, and forgiveness. For there is some good news. For in the book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse 18, it makes it so simple and so plain. It says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. Adam did it. He opened the door for sin. It says, but Christ, one act of righteousness, regardless of what Adam did, but Christ, one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and it brings new life for everybody. And then in verse 21, it says, so just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God Wonderful grace rules instead of oh, praise God for his grace giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ changes everything. God's grace, his unmerited favor, means you can't work for it. You didn't deserve it. <coughs> it wasn't because you were right. It wasn't because you were good. It wasn't because you was cute. 
wasn't because you were well educated. It wasn't because you was born with a silver spoon in your mouth or you come from the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks. It's just God's grace and his love. That's why we thank him for his amazing grace. We sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but I can see because Jesus changes everything. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed because Jesus changes everything. It ain't been easy, but I can stand and testify through many dangers, toils, snares. I've already come. It was grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace. Don't leave me on. Because Jesus, Jesus changes everything. Serving God. You take one step. He'll take two. two. There's no limit what God can do. I've been running for Jesus a mighty long time. I'm not tired. I'm not tired. I've been climbing up the mountain. But I'm not, I'm not tired. I've been down in that valley. I'm tired. But I'm not tired. I'm not tired. I've been rebuked and scorned. I'm not tired. But I'm not.